to uh, another uh, politics event. Um, but I want to thank you all for being at this point. Um, I want to start off first by also thanking the uh, Coke Foundation uh, for sponsoring another event of ours. Uh, next, I, I want to feel obliged to know that today we have an event hosted by the politics department uh, with a speaker from the philosophy and religion department at the University of North Texas speaking on uh, uh, the greatest and most renowned uh, literary figures of all time. Uh, this, although I want to note it, I know it's not really remarkable here. It's rather unremarkable for this audience. Um, I know this is also unremarkable for uh, Dr. Martin Yaffe, who will be speaking today, as he uh, has dedicated most of his, all of his academic career to considering a wide variety of important topi topics and everything in between. Um, he's published works and taught courses on such thinkers as Leo Strauss, Maimonides, and Spinoza. He also teaches courses on political and social justice, Judaic religion and philosophy, as well as metaphysics. Uh, so it's no surprise that his topic today incorporates all of the major issues that you would expect Shakespeare to bring about, including political, philosophical, philosophical, and theological issues. According to Dr. Yaffe uh, and some of the correspondence we've had, this helps to bring about some of the fullest discussions that one can have about man and his relation to other men and to God. Uh, I want, I'll ask you to just uh, give Dr. Yaffe a hand and appreciation for his time and effort today. Thank you for your kind remarks. Now I have to live up to them. Is, is that is this, is this better now? Uh, uh, thank you for your kind remarks. In case that didn't get through. Uh, the uh, title of my talk is uh, "Another Look at Shakespeare's Jewish Play." In connection with the religious and racial prejudices common to his time, in particular, the playwright is routinely excoriated or else apologized for rather weakly, for his seemingly unfair treatment of Jews in his Jewish play, The Merchant of Venice. Central to its plot is the long-standing hatred between a Christian merchant, Antonio, and a Jewish moneylender, Shylock. At least three morally shocking incidents occur. Shylock grants Antonio an emergency loan, interest-free, but with a pound of Antonio's flesh as collateral for late payment. Shock number one. Ultimately, Shylock's, uh, Shylock soon finds occasion to sue in court to collect his collateral. Shock number two. And ultimately, Shylock's suit backfires when the court surprisingly finds him guilty of being an alien, a non-Venetian, who conspires against the life of a Venetian citizen. Though, when it then shows mercy by bypassing the statutory punishment of death and impoverishment, where half of Shylock's property would have gone to the state and the other half to his intended victim, in favor of a fine and of Antonio's merely administering his half to his intended uh, as trustee for Shylock's heirs, it does so only with Antonio's further stipulation that Shylock convert to Christianity. Shock number three. How could anyone who writes such stuff, we now ask, be very nice to Jews? The case against Shakespeare here is twofold. On the one hand, once incidents such as the foregoing are seen for what they are morally, it's hard to resist interpreting the play as a whole simply in their terms. On the other hand, the play undeniably draws from an appalling legacy of misunderstanding and mistrust of Jews in England uh, from, say, 1290, when Jews were officially expelled, till at least 1753, when the ill-fated Jew Bill, as it was called, momentarily dropped professing the sacraments as a naturalization requirement, and so, in effect, opened up citizenship to Jews who had begun to be formally admitted, uh, readmitted under Cromwell a century earlier. Now obviously the two arguments, textual and historical, are mutually reinforcing. Even so, separately or together, they remain weak and gain plausibility only where moral indignation or the like 
displaces critical judgment in interpreting Shakespeare's play. To see why, let's look at the historical argument first before going to the textual one. Now, a convenient place to view the sort of historical evidence brought forward against the playwright is James Shapiro's deep backgrounder, Shakespeare and the Jews, show and tell. Okay. Shapiro draws from chronicles, legal opinions, sermons, stories, plays, political pamphlets, and theological tracts surrounding what he calls the cultural moment of the play's first staging. He disclaims any overall interpretation of Shakespeare's play or of the playwright's private intention, for that matter. He looks instead to what other Englishmen at the time are seen to have thought about Jews and then finds in passing some evidence from the play itself to suggest that Shakespeare must have thought more or less the same. While insisting that he does not mean to condemn Shakespeare for sharing his countrymen's thoughts, Shapiro nevertheless does not raise the all-important complementary question that would go a long way toward either confirming his across-the-board conclusion, or rather assumption, or else possibly distinguishing Shakespeare from those among Shakespeare con Shakespeare's countrymen who saw the playwright's deeper merit from his more or less thoughtless contemporaries. It's the question of whether or how far the text of the play itself might show its author to have been someone who could, in the decisive respect, think about Jews independently of what he understood his contemporaries to have thought about them so as to instruct or ennoble his countrymen in turn by addressing the moral shortcomings of their thoughts about Jews. Shapiro limits himself to considering the particular role of Jews in the development of Englishmen's awareness of themselves as a nation whose national poet Shakespeare was to become. According to Shapiro, Jews in Englishmen's eyes became a touchstone not so much of who Englishmen were as of what they were not. This fact would explain Englishmen's ongoing fascination with Jews, even or especially during the three and a half centuries when Jews were officially absent or only minimally present in England. Here, refreshingly, Sh Shapiro means to correct the oversights and omissions of mainstream British historians. Jews, he finds, were never entirely absent from England. Among other things, he doubts the suddenness and thoroughness of their expulsion under at Edward II and of their readmission under Cromwell, partly because documents to certify either event are hard to find, and partly because according to the plethora of evidence that fills Shapiro's book, Englishmen do not seem to have stopped talking about Jews in the meantime. The range of popular misinformation about Jews was full enough and its availability constant enough to suggest to Shapiro that Elizabethans in particular lacking as yet sufficiently broad national traditions of their own, needed something both alien and akin to themselves in order to measure themselves by. Differently stated, their skewed opinions about Jewish religious practices and their generally unfounded supp suppositions about Jews' racial characteristics, nationality, criminality, sexuality, and related matters did not merely embellish the recently formed social bond connecting all English, Englishmen, but helped to cement it. The more fanciful and outrageous the opinion projected onto Jews, one might say, the more we are shown of Englishmen's transitional worries about themselves in common. Or to adapt a phrase to Shapiro's way of looking at his subject, the newly emerged nationwide prejudice, uh, prejudices about Jews recapitulated the nascent national pathology. Now certainly such worries and prejudices are, as Shapiro suggests, part of the shadowy background to Shakespeare's play. Shapiro gathers them so as to let readers of The Merchant of Venice begin to perceive the play's broad themes with some historical depth. In a chapter on Elizabethan's notions of Jewish criminality, for example, Shapiro points out that although the identification of Jews with usury had long preceded Shakespeare's England, by the late 1500s, that identification had increasingly narrowed to emphasize what was reputed to be their, quote, outrageous and exploitative lending for profit. That's Shapiro. In another uh, chapter, on Elizabethan's notions of circumcision as the background for the play's pound of flesh theme, 
Shapiro cites the contemporary theological discussion about the meaning of circumcision of the heart in St. Paul's letter to the Romans with the suggestion that Shylock's insistence on a pound of Antonio's flesh might be a metaphor for genital circumcision or even castration. Shapiro's chapter on Elizabethan's notion of conversion, moreover, notes their suspicion that a Jewess who, being uncircumcised to begin with, could easily convert, might just as easily revert to the Old Covenant, and speculates that that suspicion may underlie the disturbing exchange between Shylock's runaway daughter, Jessica, and her Christian bridegroom, Lorenzo, at the beginning of Act Five, where the honeymooners compare their hasty marriage to several thwarted love affairs of classical antiquity. And finally, in a chapter on Elizabethan's puzzlement over whether to consider Jews a race, a nation, or simply aliens, Shapiro remarks that, quote, Shylock cannot really be understood independent of the larger social tensions generated by aliens and their economic practices in London in the mid-1590s. And commenting on the likeness between the laws of Shakespeare's Venice and those of a typical English city under a feudal monarch, he infers that the playwright has given us a self-contradictory or fantasy resolution to the problem posed by Shylock. And I'm quoting a couple of sentences of Shapiro's. As much as it might want to, given its charter, Venetian society cannot publish Shylock simply because he's a Jew. But in terms of the play, it can convict him as a threatening alien. In order to accomplish this delicate maneuver in the space of three dozen lines, the nature of Shylock's difficulty is reconstituted. A Jew at the start of uh, the speech, three lines later, he's an alien. Yet once Shylock is convicted as an alien, he can be punished not as an alien, but as a Jew who must, must quote, presently become a Christian, an expression from the play. The historical import of these and other distorted and derogatory images of Jews, according to Shapiro, was to cast doubt over whether Jews could ever be trusted as denizens, much less fellow citizens of England. To the extent that Shakespeare may be said to have given further currency to such images, he also seems to have lent them further credibility as his national stature rose. As Shapiro finds when looking in his concluding chapter at the public debate over the Jew bill more than a century and a half later, these same images uh, continued to be invoked by opponents of the bill, Shapiro notes, and led to its repeal barely two years after its passage, despite arguments in its favor drawn from more enlightened thinkers like John Tolland, Daniel Defoe, and John Locke. Shapiro leads us to infer, though he doesn't put it in so many words, that the bill might have had an easier time of it had Shakespeare thought better than to write The Merchant of Venice in the first place. Now here's where the limitations of uh, Shapiro's argument become apparent, at least to me. Assuming that the popular images, as Shapiro describes them, were as decisive politically as he suggests, there seems to be a further need to explain why Parliament itself was not altogether dazzled by them, at least for a time. Why, in short, did public life become as receptive as it was to the position in favor of tolerance of Jews as, as articulated by Tolland, Defoe, Locke, and others. Here Shapiro is comparatively silent. It's testimony perhaps to the difficulty of this question that it would require him to widen the scope of his inquiry, to move from the narrower question of the popular prejudices latent and prevailing at a given hour, that's what Sh Shapiro seems to mean by cultural history, or cultural moment, to the broader question of how responsible statesmanship would have to discern and guide such prejudices on important public issues like the Jew Bill. Let me come closer to the point. Given at least the modest success of enlightened statesmanship in 1753 in overcoming the not entirely admirable images of Jews found in Shakespeare's then popular play, wouldn't we have to ask, as Shapiro does not, whether Shakespeare himself might have had enough statesmanlike insight to be able to anticipate and even encourage these same possibilities, however modestly, in his presentation of Shylock. The moment this question occurs, 
unless we simply decide to rule out certain answers beforehand, we're forced to look again at the manifestly unflattering things said of and by Jews in Shakespeare's play to see whether they are indeed the play's last word or whether, on the contrary, they might also call to mind other, more salutary images of the behavior of Jews and of Christians embedded as well in the psyches of his viewing and reading audience. And to this second or textual question, let me now turn. Let me start with the first morally shocking image, the pound of flesh collateral. What's the difference between looking at this image as Shapiro largely does, as something resembling, except maybe in intent, a propaganda cartoon in its power to haunt and disturb, as Shapiro says, and looking at it first and foremost instead as part of a Shakespearean play. Well, in Shakespeare's play, it's pieced together with a larger story. And the full meaning of the image, therefore, depends on its connection with that larger story insofar as the audience may be expected to discern that connection. So what information does the play supply such that when the pound of flesh clause first comes up, we're prepared to connect it with what's gone before as well as what, what is to come. Two things are striking. First, Shylock's already told us just why he hates Antonio. Not only is Antonio a Christian, but worse, Antonio is making Shylock the target of his one-man religious crusade against usury on the Rialto. Antonio, in other words, is bad for Shylock's business. Second, Shylock has also told us how he gets along with Christians for practical purposes. In response to a gracious dinner invitation by the beneficiary of Antonio's loan, Bassanio, Shylock snaps that his socializing with them is limited to business negotiations and does not include eating or drinking or praying, presumably because Shylock observes the Orthodox Jewish dietary laws, including laws stipulating the proper prayers accompanying eating and drinking, which Christians do not share. Yet, lest the audience jump to the conclusion that since Shylock appears to be an observant Jew, his pound of flesh clause is perfectly compatible with Jewish orthodoxy, or that Jews as such are permitted to go so far as to kill Christians out of hatred or revenge by dubious reasons of, say, Leviticus 19 uh, or uh, 24, Shakespeare inserts a further incident shortly after the note signing. Shylock decides to accept Bassanio's dinner invitation anyway. In hate, as he says, quote, to feed upon the prodigal Christian. And in a related remark, quote, to help waste his borrowed purse, end quote. Now given his awareness of Bassanio's prodigal spending habits, Shylock's presence at what promises to be a lavish occasion would seem to enhance the likelihood of another loan for Bassanio or even a default on the present loan with its unfortunate consequences for Antonio. The point is that in planning to eat Bassanio's food, Shylock knowingly steps outside Jewish orthodoxy as regards his dealings with Antonio. In short, Shakespeare has presented us not with a stereotypical Jew, but with one who knows he cannot achieve his nefarious uh, aims without the, w within the bonds, bounds of Jewish law, but departs from that law in his effort to achieve them. Now, were the play just to stop at this point, admittedly, the passing suggestion that Shylock has deliberately disregarded his own religion uh, here would not take us very far. But it does prepare us in turn for how the playwright means for us to take the second moral shock to which I referred. The second shock, <clears throat> Shylock's actually taking Antonio to court, receives an important comment within the play itself by the Duke of Venice, who presides over the trial. In his initial formal address to the plaintiff, he pleads with Shylock to abandon his suit as an act of, quote, mercy and remorse, end quote, toward Antonio. Antonio is said to deserve Shylock's pity in the light of his overwhelming shipping losses, the putative cause of his failure to repay on time. In the circumstances, the Duke adds, Shylock uh, ought to forgive not only Antonio's penalty, but some of his principle too. 
What's important here are the Duke's announced reasons for expecting some last minute out of court refinancing from Shylock. First, he says, everyone, including himself, believes that Shylock is merely stalling so as to make his eventual show of compassion more spectacular. That is, the Duke attributes to Shylock a sense of theatrics. Second, there's also the depressing magnitude of Antonio's reported losses. Enough, he says, and I'm quoting a few lines from the Duke's speech, to press a royal merchant down and pluck commiseration of his state from brassy bosoms and rough hearts of flint, from stubborn Turks and Tartars never trained to offices of gentle courtesy. That is, Antonio's misfortunes would make even hard-boiled, crudely raised observers act compassionately. Turks and Tartars come to the Duke's mind. Hence, he concludes, quote, we all expect a gentle answer, Jew. Now, the pertinent question is whether the Duke's concluding reminder that Shylock is a Jew means that he manifestly includes Jews among those who are by nature and or upbringing ungentle. Two reasons suggest that he does, but then again, a third may be seen to override these. First, a pun on gentle leads gentile, uh, yields gentile, implying that the Duke is seeking a gentile or un-Jewish answer from Shylock. And second, the Duke has already confided to Antonio privately that he considers Shylock incorrigible. Still, third, the Duke, whatever his private opinion, cannot admit publicly that Shylock as Jew was never trained to be gentle, that is to say by Jewish law, without weakening his earlier argument that Shylock's apparent lack of compassion was only a theatrical delay. The inescapable conclusion here is that the Duke is forced to give the public impression to Shylock and everyone else in the court that Jewish law does, after all, teach moral decency, including compassion, and that Shylock, being uncompassionate, is simply being a bad Jew, that is, one who is disloyal or disobedient to his own law. This view will soon be confirmed on theological grounds by Bassanio's recent bride, Portia, who arrives late and in disguise as a friend of the court in her stunning quality of mercy speech. The theological premise of Portia's speech is that what Christians call the Lord's Prayer is a Jewish as well as a Christian prayer. Hence, its teaching, as Portia understands it, namely that mercy is a necessary supplement to justice, though not a replacement for it, is common to both Jew and Christian, though each is in danger of misinterpreting that teaching one-sidedly. Jews habituated to Jewish law tend to emphasize justice and to soft-pedal mercy, while Christians, receptive to the gospel of love, tend toward the opposite extreme. The proper mean, Portia insists, is for mercy to, quote, season or moderate justice. Now, because she's in the first instance addressing Shylock in court, her rhetoric emphasizes mercy. Still, being mindful of Shylock's Jewish shortcomings does not make her unmindful of those of the play's model Christian, Antonio. And oddly, that's just why she soon goes out of her way to invite Antonio to exercise mercy by encouraging him to participate in reformulating Shylock's sentence. Antonio, typically, overdoes it in his package proposal for how Shylock should live the entire rest of his life. And this fact goes a long way toward absorbing, or rather accounting for, our third moral shock, that of Shylock's forced conversion. In retrospect, Antonio's excesses here turn out to be, Pace Shapiro, the, the understated theme of the play as a whole. We must keep in mind from word one uh, that Shakespeare presents Antonio as a morose man, and yet moroseness, achadia in uh, Antonio's Latin, is for Christians, Catholic Christians, sinful a capital vice, as Thomas Aquinas calls it. For while forgivable in itself, it leads to other vices. In Antonio's case, that vice is connected with his routinely charitable behavior, 
which almost every other Venetian admires, but few, if any, choose to emulate, including his public crusade to replace usury on the Rialto with old-fashioned charity and his private generosity in financing Bassanio's string of prodigal, money-losing ventures. Yet because Antonio lacks a sense of justice, or is, in lack, or is lacking in his sense of justice, or at any rate of proportion, in his treatment of both Shylock and Bassanio, his form of charitableness cannot in the end be distinguished from meddlesomeness. In Shylock's legally tolerated and economically necessary loan business, for example, as well as in Bassanio's marriage. To say the least, Antonio's trial pointedly interrupts Portia's wedding night. What Portia cannot correct, but can only expose indirectly in court, however, she can subsequently correct at home. As the denouement to her subtly contrived ring plot, she ultimately gets Antonio to swear to give up meddling in her own family, if not in others. But to see Shakespeare's muted critique of the possible excesses of Christian charitableness here, and to recognize just why he had to mute that critique throughout the play, we must reconsider each incident as it occurs, shocks and all, with the prospect of Portia's twin theological teaching in mind. None of this is to deny the possible bearing of the arguments of Shapiro and other chronicles, chroniclers of moral abuses. Rather, it's to see where Shakespeare, in his statesmanlike way, faced those abuses more fully and constructively. So in short, the serious teaching of the play may be said to be the critique of Antonio's religion when it is understood, or rather misunderstood, as saying that all human beings really need is love, that is to say, charity or mercy, to the exclusion of justice or fairness, or in other words, law. Just as Antonio acts unjustly in not knowing where to draw the limits when charitably financing what turns out to be Bassanio's needlessly expensive wooing trip to Belmont, so too he acts unjustly in his not knowing where to draw the limits by harassing Shylock, and so provoking Shylock's correspondingly one-sided reaction in turn. Portia's solution, unlike Antonio's, is not religious intolerance, nor, unlike Shylock's, is it an, an indifference to the religious teachings that Jews and Christians share. Instead, Portia, or in his way, Shakespeare, sees how both Jew, uh, Jewish and Christian teaching, both the Torah and the Gospels, recognize mutatis mutandis. I can use that expression here, can't I? In other words, in its way. The, uh, recognize the ongoing need for both justice and mercy, that is, in practice, statesmanlike moderation. That's it. So, uh, I have a question not about your characterization of Shakespeare's ultimate judgment on the characters, which I found very convincing, but about one aspect of your defense of him against the charge of playing to anti Jewish stereotypes. That he shows, in a couple, you, you showed that Shakespeare makes clear in a couple ways that what Shylock is doing is not behaving like a good Jew. But why couldn't that just, I mean, I don't, I don't know if this is true, but why couldn't that just be Shakespeare playing into a stereotype that would say, and Jews aren't even good Jews. When they, you know, we know what the Torah says, but when they get the chance for revenge, man, they don't even follow that law of theirs. I mean, in that individual case, of course, that's true. What struck me, though, was the, was the, um, the deliberateness of Shylock's deciding to violate kashrut, as it's called, in other words, kosher dietary uh, laws. I mean, uh, he even debates him. He goes home and uh, you know he's angry. He seems always to be angry at home. He's not a very good father. The, the mother has gone, uh, died, I think, not left. And um, he says, you know, I think I'm going to go. You know, they they don't really want me there, uh, but I'll. They don't. 
that they don't like or love me or something like that. They, I'm not invited in love. I'm going to go anyway. And that's where he says uh, to kind of eat into the expenses he has. And he, he, you know, he doesn't spell out the results of that. Uh, and so we're left to infer. But, but that is really, uh, I think, a major sort of thing. In other words, the, the deliberate uh, uh, transgression of the dietary laws. It, it, it's among the most intimate of laws for a, an observant Jew. Uh, what, what you eat. Um, uh, I mean, in other ways, he, uh, you know, well, he, he says he, can't, he doesn't have 3,000 ducats uh, handy. But you know, what's the, what's, what of that I can go to a, a fellow, you know, Tubal is his name, another uh, Jewish uh, sort of wealthy person who we Maybe that person is also on the Rialto, maybe not. The Rialto is where the, uh, the banks, in other words, the money changers, um, the loan sharks. <laughs> it's it's a, a better description of the status of those people. Um, and uh, presumably there's no interest involved between him and a Tubal. So, so that's in line with Jewish line. They're meeting at the synagogue, which you sort of wonder about. But, but th th that, I don't think, is uh, meant to be offensive particularly. I mean, that would make a certain amount of sense. Uh, where is he going to meet? I mean, again, maybe I'm rambling too much, but I think it's understood that Jews, look, Jews are not citizens or, if you like, subjects. They can't be, be if, if professing the sacraments is a, in a, a citizenship requirement, okay? So why are they in Venice? Well, Jews have to be some way. They don't have their own country at this point. Or they're in exile and all the rest of it. Uh, but, but there seems to be a need that, Traditionally, Venice, ha you know, Venice's laws and so on haven't really anticipated that a, a need arising from the fact that a commerce is going to return to the Mediterranean, and Venice is going to be in a pivotal position to kind of benefit from that, and is going to choose to do that as a shipping uh, um, a place for um, you know uh, venture cap capital things <laughs> and all the rest of it. So, but, but if you keep in place the, the biblical prohibition of lending money at interest, at, at least to fellow Christians, by just taking that over from the prohibition of interest of lending to fellow Jews, and again, that wasn't really designed, uh, designed for um, having a commercial society, you know, a society with banks. I mean, what was the need for it? Um, the need for loans in, let's just say, the biblical context, and it's just simply taken over by uh, Christian teaching, is uh, you have these uh, landed, uh, inalienable landed estates for patriarchal families. But one, an estate could go under, so you would, might need an emergency loan. And where would you go? Well, your neighbor might have some interest in, in providing that, but, but the biblical law goes even further because it exhorts you, you know, God will, in a, in a sense, bless you for doing this, even though you're doing it in, you know, the sixth year, uh, in, on the seventh year, in the sabbatical year, all loans are, are um, canceled. So that, in general, is the biblical understanding of banking. That means, namely, there isn't any. Uh, but in, in, um, at the same time, it, it permits interest taking or usury, if you like, from, from non-Israelites. And again, if you look at it in that context. So that, in a sense, is the opening for Venice to say, well, OK, let's just get some non-Christians to supply this need. I mean, the, the alternative way would be to raise money by, uh, in a sense, going public. And so you, you, your, your venture consists of shares. And if, if people are willing to risk that, I mean, they're not, and if, they, if the venture fails, so they just lose it. But this way, you know. So that, I mean, that seems to be the deep background to the, to the loan question. And um, maybe I'm talking too much, but I mean, I think I'll just say one more thing to, to show where I think this goes to the heart of what the issue in the play is, is about. Venice is a city in transition, right? It's got these um, uh, pre-modern laws, let's just call them. And they call them that, with Christianity as the, as the social bond. But if you're going to open up, you know, the, the Mediterranean is now pacified, and you're going to open up and become a big trading city in some sense, uh, okay, so there are these, these new kinds of circumstances. Uh, I mean, I, I think when you look in the rest of the play and you look at the status of, uh, look, I mean, it's occurred to me that uh, the way it's presented, uh, Antonio is the only serious Christian in all of Venice. I mean, I realize that's a ridiculous thing to say in one sense, but who else goes around 
uh, you know, buying up the notes to Shylock so that others won't have to suffer. So he pays off Shylock right away, including presumably the interest. Now, I don't think he expects not to be paid by the people, <laughs> but, but he doesn't, you know, the in interest keeps mounting, you know, sort of like the mafia, you know, every day the interest keeps mounting. You know. So he stops that, you know, or I, 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 I'm probably exaggerating a bit, but maybe not by much. So, and that might, might be the explanation why everybody loves Antonio, of course, wouldn't, and it's not that he's not intrinsically lovable, but, but they really kind of like him. I was kind of um, thinking back on that just a little bit. Uh, one thing that struck me as, as peculiar, and I thought you might be able to comment on it, is in the courtroom, when the tables have been turned on Shylock, uh, one character that, that, that struck me as I was going to not Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what, what do you make of that in light of Shakespeare's view of uh, what he's, you know, what, what you say Shakespeare has to, like, done to maybe uh, reform someone's opinion yeah. of yeah. Uh, Jewish religion and Jewish law and what yeah. Gratiano, then a purported Christian, mm -hmm. uh, does in, in acting in the same way as him. Yeah. yeah, I make a lot of that, actually. And... Um, it's this way. We are first introduced to Graziano as a kind of clownish fella in, 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 uh, who never stops talking. I mean, Bassanio is saying this when he introduces, you know, after uh, you know, let me play the fool and so on. If, if, I, I'm sorry to be alluding to speeches rather than quoting the whole thing. But this is right at the beginning. And it turns out his best friend for the past two years has been Lorenzo, who, event, who is about to elope with Jessica, that's Shylock's daughter. And we'll learn more about them by the end of the play. Uh, and Lorenzo even then says, um, you know, in so many words, yeah, I've known this guy two years, I can't get a word in edgewise. I mean, but, but what impresses me is that he has gotten maybe a word or two in, 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 in edgewise in the following way. His beautiful speeches in Act Five are, in a sense, Pythagorean speeches. That is to say, they, they have a Pythagorean understanding of the cosmos as the harmony of the spheres and so on and so on. And, and with his own sort of private recipe for solving uh, political difficulties, namely, if everybody just listened to music, it would all be solved. Right? All the, the problem is we're also shown during the play that both Antonio and Shylock are indifferent to music or hate it. Right? I mean, there's, there, that's pointed out. Shylock tells his daughter before he leaves uh, the home on the fateful bank for the fateful banquet, you know, it, it, it's Mardi Gras or something. You know, close up my houses, my, the, the houses ears. I mean, the windows, the casements, in other words. So you don't hear that horrible music from the street. Hey, they're just having fun. No, that's. And then uh, Antonio is somewhat irritated on that same evening with all the celebrating going on because he's got to see uh, Bassanio off uh, at, at the wharf, you know, to go to Belmont and possibly lose him forever and all the rest of it. So, uh, okay, so uh, uh, Lorenzo is a Pi... Now, the point about the Pythagoreanism, I take to be this. Um, with Graziano, uh, well, you know, I've got to bring in one other uh, uh, sort of parallel character, and that's the servant of um, Shylock, who's kind of lazy but kind of fun. And, and you know, Shylock uh, it keeps criticizing him. It, it doesn't seem to do any good because he's, he's just who he is. Um, and so we first see him where he's debating to himself whether or not he should run away from uh, Shylock. He doesn't know that Shylock's already made a deal for him to uh, sort of trade him off to Bassanio. Again, another expense of Bassanio's money. You know, take, uh, take um, uh, what's his name? Uh, 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 Lancelot, the name of the servant, and you know, two future draft choices or something like this. I mean, uh, so he's glad to get rid of him. But 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 so he's but Lancelot is trying to think, uh, you know, uh, what his conscience is going to try to tell him. You know, should he run away? Or should he not? So he's debating these theological questions in as much as he can. He's not an educated person theologically or in any other way. But it's completely ineffective. In other words, it's a little indication that Christian teaching that might have been helpful to him hasn't you know, gotten too far with him. I mean, that, that's a small thing. And, and that, to some extent, explains why uh, Graziano is maybe in a similar sort of situation. That is to say, uh, he, the only thing that can explain uh, Antonio's or, or Shylock's behavior and being so unforgiving is that he must be subhuman. Uh, and, and, and to explain, I mean, in other words, he doesn't explain it in terms of original sin, you know, which would be the way to go, right? But uh, from a Christian point of view, from a Catholic point of view, certainly. Um, 
but that um, uh, he must have been born, his mother must have been a wolf or some other animal that has this behavior, and he mentions the name of Pythagoras. Now, where would the name Pythagoras come up from, somebody like that, unless he'd gotten it from his more educated friend, uh, Lorenzo? So, you know, that was maybe the one word. I mean, he maybe sort of got it semi-wrong, but, you know, when others reincarnation from animal mothers produces a Jew, I mean, I don't know. He's, uh, he's just confused about that. But... Um, uh, he's a wild and crazy guy, as they used to say on Saturday Night Live. Uh, and it, and uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, let's get real questions. <laughs> Can I get him for them? Yeah, it doesn't get very far. Um, but he puts Pisani on this position of, of perpetual bondage to him, this, this position of perpetual guilt. Mm -hmm. um, you, uh, so anyway, I, I like uh, approaching this play by, by getting beyond the superficial reading of Antonio and trying to get beyond the superficial reading of Antonio. Now, in terms of his Christianity, you said that the only serious Christian, I think it's a play full of bad Christians, right? Like Graziano, <laughs> like that. Well, let, let me say, yeah, go ahead. Well, I mean, I see it in terms of her, of the Lord's Prayer, you know, which is, which is Matthew 6, but, but, uh, but that is, in a sense, testimony that it's a Jewish prayer. If you look at a, an Orthodox Jewish prayer book nowadays and you look at the preliminary prayers, meditations, you know, you come to the synagogue and you sit and you wait and you get in the, the proper attitude, mood, and you're reading these uh, sort of set preliminary prayers. I mean, you, you don't have to read them, but they're there to read. And, I, I mean, I stumbled on this myself. I, I started reading these things, and I said, well, wait a minute, this sounds like the Lord's Prayer. I, I, I went to public school in Canada, and every day we started with the Lord's Prayer. I didn't mind. I mean, I learned stuff, and we had gospel lessons and everything. So, I'm, But anyway, I know nowadays it's out of fashion to, to say that or to do that. But so it, it sort, of a, uh, uh, sort of astounded me that, oh, wait a minute, the Lord's Prayer is actually in the Jewish prayer book, and it's not uh, in that concise form that it's in Matthew 6, but sentence by sentence, it's, it's spread out over those uh, prayers. So I th and now presumably Shakespeare knows this. Uh, you know, there are these arguments that Shakespeare was really Jewish and all the plays are, are esoteric, uh, Talmudic teachings. I, I mean, <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, you know, you might learn something from reading some of these things. But, um, okay, but, but, but so certainly by the choice of the Lord's Prayer as the pivotal or as the sort of connection, I mean, that was a way of establishing it without demeaning either religion, right? In other words, as, as expressive of the highest aims uh, in, in a sort of social or political sense of both religions, right? How you can be, a, in a sense, a perfect Christian, I'm not exactly sure what that would mean. I'm, I'm open to instructions on this, or, or a perfectly observant Jew. Uh, uh, so, so for, I mean, what the Jew has to learn is that, in some sense, forgiveness or 
In other words, not trying to uh, look for a law or apply a law sort of as an engineering diagram. You know, everything, there may be these crises where you somehow have to think independently, in a sense, for the sake of the law, right? I mean, you're, that's, you're in this uh, unprecedented circumstance of, let's just say, Venice. You see what I'm saying? So, uh, th I mean, I I'm still thinking of the question of Christianity, but, but the circumstances are shifting. I mean, life is shifting. So what's Christianity going to be if, if the, the end result of this commercialization of Venice means that you're going to have to decide to what extent you, 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 you can and wish to hold on to Christian teaching as the social bond, as the moral teacher, or to what extent you have to appeal, I mean, uh, you know, to reason to rethink this. Right? I mean, not, I mean that, that's not an unchristian thing to do. I mean, there's Thomas Aquinas, and he gives you all kinds of openings to do this, including telling you that, uh, you know, look, even you know, that the Pharisees talked about uh, uh, the, the need for charging interest, uh, not just to do business with foreigners, but given that there's an occasion to do it for foreigners, this is a kind of outlet for some of the more unbecoming lusts of Jews, right? You can, you, can get, you can get money, and so you can sort of channel your lower passions that way. That's Thomas. That's a per perceptive comment, I think. And, and he, by the way, quotes uh, Talmudic authority in doing this. So I mean, it's Thomas, who's wonderful. So um, Thomas Aquinas, do I have to say that? No. <laughs> just, just checking, just checking. So there's that. Um, but I mean, I, I think that uh, Look, uh, here's, here's what I was going to recommend to you, uh, or suggest to you. Uh, I think the, the, the model, in some sense, for the character of Antonio here, and maybe Shakespeare's other Antonios, too, in some sense, is Mark Antony in Plutarch. Because um, uh, he's talking about Antonio's war against the Jews. Now, now there's, the whole incident is kind of skewed as it shows up in Merchant of Venice. But you have the, des the description of the young Antonio who was in exactly the situation you're talking about. That is to say, he had an older friend, uh, Curio <laughs> was his name, who uh, kind of got him into this sophisticated world of being a playboy. And it wasn't so much playboy, but you were joining these street gangs and other kinds of adventurous things and getting him into debt. Right? And, and Mark Antony's dad didn't approve of this person. So, so the, and, 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 um, and so you... And, and, the, the incidents of Antonio's life leading up to, of course, the, uh, the, the, the assassination of Caesar are presented in a not entirely complimentary way. Uh, the, the, the sea battle that he won, uh, it's sort of like Othello's sea battle. I mean, it's the weather as much as anything that, that won the battle for him. The, the famous battle where, uh, against, against the Jews and so on to, to, um, to uh, put down the Jewish rebellion in, uh, in, in Palestine, as the Romans called it. And, and then a striking thing in, um, in uh, Plutarch, and let me just get this to quote it, which, again, sealed um, to me the interpretation of the play that I'm following, or at least confirmed it. Um, uh, you know, a couple of things. And, and, okay, I'm, I'm quoting Plutarch here. I got this set out here. He says, uh, and this is Mark Antony, but I think it applies to our Antony, Antonio also. Um, it was his character in Calamities to be better than at any other ta time. Antony, in misfortune, was most nearly a virtuous man. Now that's po Plutarch about that Antony, okay? I mean, it's Pope's translation here, or Dry Dryden's translation. And then an another sentence here. Uh, there was much simplicity in his character. He was slow to see his faults, but when he did see them, was extremely repentant and ready to ask pardon of those he had injured. That's Mark Antony, but I think it's our Antony. I think that's exactly it. So, anyway, so, yeah. Um, I wonder how far you would be willing to go in regards to uh, Antonio uh, and uh, Antonio uh, in uh, the possible analog between Antonio's behavior um, in being generous uh, as a form of usury in which uh, you replace the monetary um, debt with the spiritual debt. I mean, certainly in the case of uh, Bassanio, that's pretty 
tempting. That's what, I think that's what Dr. Moran is suggesting. Yeah. I mean... And it's a kind of debt you can't pay. <laughs> well, right, and this letter comes uh, on the day of the trial, which is also the day that um, Bassani arrives after his 90-day shipping trip, which of course is completely useless. I mean, I mean, or, or needless. But I, but so so that so and the letter comes and and he says and the letter is from Antonio through either Salarino or the other twiddled on Tweedledee person, and uh, it says, well, you, um, if you could just come back, you know, once and and let your bride know that you once had a friend like me or something like that. I mean, that's the kiss of death for a marriage, right there. And so that would confirm, I think, this, this you know, notion that, that you're bringing out. Um, I mean, th th the question is, does he know that he's doing this? Is it malicious? Well, I was, uh, I was in your associating with Christianity. Yeah. And I think that's what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. Right. The uh, if 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 I may let me um, contrast the, the Jewish view of this. Uh, I mean, I think I think it confirms your point. Uh, number one, there is no Jewish word. There is no Hebrew word for charity. It's it's all justice. But there are degrees of like what we call char charitable behavior. And while charity is obviously praiseworthy, the lowest degree is you see a person who's needy and you, you know, hi, I see you're needy, take this. Well, that's a little humiliating. And it's the other side of it's exactly what you're saying. Gee, I must be pretty good. Uh, you know, I'm, you know I'm, I'm helping a person out. So if you go through uh, eight degrees of that, in other words, eight, in other words uh, so there's a ladder of excellence, if you like, of charitable behavior. And the highest of that is, uh, where you uh, make you're you're sort of making possible for another person to to improve himself without that person even knowing, and you're you don't even know who it is because you do it through an agency, right? So it's completely anonymous, and that would be one of the intermediate intermediate degrees. So the person doesn't know, you don't know, and it's not even a direct contribution, but indirectly you're doing something. It could be monetary, it could be other things. Uh, Dr. Perrins, I hope I've got that right. I mean, it's my, my yeah, my mind. So. But he speaks for Orthodox Judaism on that point. So, yeah, I mean, uh, so, I mean, and, and then I looked at the quality of mercy speech from that point of view. And I'm, I also had in mind, you know, people, Ratsuyama is an example, people in the courtroom are ready to, you know, jump at Shylock's throat. I mean, they're really upset. I mean, and we can see why. So, it's a touchy thing. Excuse me. Yeah. Uh, is he responding to what the public expects? I'm thinking of the Jew of Malta, you know, as the epitome of the evil Jew. Yeah. And uh, so uh, anybody going to see the play with the Jew has that in the back of their mind, that they're inherently evil. Um, Here's one, di here's one difference between the two plays. And yeah, Marlowe and Shakespeare are friends and all the rest of it, and competitors and with. In the Marlowe play, you have somebody telling you how to interpret the play. You have Machiavelli himself or a Machiavellian saying, you know, this is how to do it. And so, and it turns out that, uh, you know, the three religions in there, they're all sort of interchangeably evil, you know, sort of spy versus spy versus spy. I mean, there's um, one usmanship tr going on all, all the time. And, uh, but Shakespeare doesn't f sort of force you at the beginning, and it's more you're, you're following the action, and uh, it's sort of what we've been doing here. I mean, you may not have a lot of time during the performance of the play to reflect, although you can be sort of shocked and sort of think about it, and you'll say, well, maybe I'll think that through later, you know. And now, does Shylock really deserve all that much? I mean, maybe, maybe not. But... Um, you know, as Hemming and Condell say in their letter to the first folio, it really, it's, it's meant, these plays are meant to be read and reread again and again and all that sort of thing. Uh, and so on the rereading, when you notice that, you know, how is this meant to fit together and so on? So that's, I mean, that's in general how I'd, I would approach that. And I think it's precisely because you might say the audience has certain expectations that are then being thwarted in some sense uh, that, 
you, know, you, you have a chance. You can't force people to reflect. But it is remarkable that English opinion somehow turns around. So uh, that's where I, I don't go with Shapiro. I don't think he's made his case that Shakespeare has made life worse for Jews in England by writing that play. Or, or Harold Bloom, for example, who that, that's the one play he thinks is not of timeless worth, or however Ben Johnson said. Uh, I, I think it is of timeless worth. So, yeah, I'm sorry. I, no problem at all. Um, I just want to get clear on your main thesis. Well, I have your main thesis, I know, but the three points. So, yeah. the common view, which is kind of, say so the common view is, as you said, there are these three shocking moments and they're just uh, and they're obvious, right? They're like yeah. on stage, yeah. or whatever. It, so, I mean, to, to our moral sensibilities, anyway, yeah. Uh, right. Yeah. Well, okay, yeah, I was suppressing a question. <laughs> is it, was this really something that you could sue in court for? A, a pound of cash as collateral? <laughs> Presumably, our law is going to permit that. But, uh, but there was something like that in the Twelve Tables. I mean, there's something like that in Roman law. Okay, yeah. now, uh, but yeah, so. The pound of flesh as collateral, that's shocking. Your response to that was actually on stage or in the, and in the speeches. So in the speeches and deeds, we see that Shylock is, has a motive. He hates this guy for these reasons. Yeah. Um, but also, if it's explicit through little things here and there, that Shylock in his action is, in his demand is de, uh, departing from yeah. Judaism. Fine. Yeah. Then the second one is that he sues in court. So he actually <laughs> pursues his, uh, yeah. his ends. Um, and your response to that charge is that, um, for instance, the Duke's speech residing in the court is internally consistent. Yeah. Uh, and yet uh, is basically saying that Shylock is not acting Jewishly because he's not, or in accordance with Jewish law, because he's not acting compassionately. Yeah. Um, yeah. Or, or at, at best, he's acting theatrically, is that right? Yeah. Uh, and then Portia, Portia backed that up. Yeah. Because when you said she comes in and gives a speech about mercy, which would seem to be an extreme of Christianity, and then a tempering justice, whereas justice by itself would seem to be a certain extreme of Judaism. Uh, Is that correct? Or, 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 right, or a certain misunderstanding of Judaism. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. But what was the, so the third one is that Shylock's forced conversion. And yeah. I just miss it. How is that publicly shown, or you know, on stage shown to be... It's not in court. It, you, I mean, you sort of can't criticize... Antonio publicly. I mean, he, I, I think he's that much of a kind of icon or, or something like the poster boy for something. I mean, he's the last credible, I mean, again, this may sound really off the wall, but uh, in terms of the play, he's, he's as Christian as you get in the play. Again, I, I, that sounds like an insulting comment. Well, if it, I mean, if, I guess if it's Shakespeare's, Shakespeare's not insulting, but I mean, I think he's trying to show you something. So, so she has to do it privately, that's my point. She, but, but what, what is shown of him is that, look, if he's a morose man, then already, I mean, there's, there's a sin that you can point to that he is guilty of, namely the sin of moroseness. Uh, the, the blues, right? I mean, that is sinful according to Catholic teaching. I, I, mean, I don't know how, what, it, what the status of that is in the, in the, in the pews today, but uh, certainly in Thomas, it's, it's uh, set forth. And you're saying Portia or Portia or Portia? Uh -huh. Somehow she's key to the rebuttal on the third, to that third shock that she... She seems to know independently. I mean, I mean that's, somehow Portia seems to be able to address all the, speed, all the other speeches of the play that she never heard. I mean, it's quite a much. You know, Shylock said, hath not a Jew eyes and all the rest of it. Um, and so she takes the issue of Jews and Christians being equal in human terms, well, actually, that speech sort of shows that they're equal in sort of subhuman terms because they're equal in terms of their body parts and so on, except that they both can laugh and cry, so that's, I guess, a little, <laughs> a little more. Uh, but she seems to, uh, you know, see you and raise you on, on that point without ever having heard the speech. I mean, unless, I mean, she has, look, she's incredibly, look, supposedly she hears about the trial and everything else uh, right after the correct casket is chosen. We haven't even talked about that. And then she's able to size up things instantly. Well, some things you, you could do instantly. Namely, um, she understands that there's a question on Bassanio's mind. Who are you supposed to love the most, your wife or your best friend? And uh, it, it should not be a question, but it is. So that's got to be solved for the sake of the marriage. You've got to love your wife before your best friend. But you can't just 
nag your husband about I mean, you know, you, you've got to preempt that whole issue some way. And then it turns out that, that her cousin, I mean, she's not in email communication with him. So, but, but her cousin is this brilliant law professor at Padua, which is 20 miles away, which is in turn 20 miles away from Venice, right? Uh, so somehow she's able to send her servant to Padua saying, quick, give me everything you know, plus the clothes, the garments whereby I can masquerade in court or something like that as a, get this, a young doctor of Rome. That's, it's just an extraordinary line, right? Because doctor, I mean, could mean a doctor of laws, but it could mean a, a teacher. It could mean a teacher from Rome. That's where you got to the degree, but it could mean a teacher of, of Rome in the theological sense or a teacher to, you know, uh, subjective, objective, genitive, you know, take it from there. It's just extraordinary. So and I think Porsche is all those things. I guess that replies to the, uh, the, the Christian question. So she disapproves of the Shylock's horse conversion? There's nothing she can do at that point. She's played out her hand. But look, uh, here's, a, here's a, go, go back to her entry into court, right? And her first question, and, and this is, I think, very much misinterpreted by the critics I read, which is the merchant here and which the Jew? This is how she starts. And so they have to identify, okay, uh, now, it, 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 then she says of Sh to Shylock, of a strange nature is this suit that you bring forth. Now, the word strange keeps popping up. And uh, it is strange in the sense that it's un unprecedented in Venice, or it seems to be. I mean, even though there is a law covering it, the Duke has forgotten it. Luckily, his legal counsel over in Padua has remembered it, okay? And it, this is all sort of instant. I mean, it's as if they had email, when of course they really don't. Um, so, I mean, then she says when, when he ad admits, uh, she gets admi Antonio to admit that, you know, he stands in the debt, you know, he stands liable for the, this particular collateral and it, uh, you know, it's, it's self-evident that's going to mean the end of his life. Uh, and, oh, you stand within his danger, do you not? That's the line. Look, the eventual law is any stranger, I mean alien, who puts an Athenian citizen in danger, of his, uh, in danger, danger of his life, is subject to this horrible decree. And what struck me about all this, two things. One, Portia is trying to uh, get Shylock to throw in the towel early on so that he will not stay in the danger of being subject to that penalty that nobody else in the courtroom knows about. That is to say, uh, Venice has so forgotten this sort of law to protect its own citizens in the interest of its cosmopolitan look to the rest of the world. You know, be a citizen of the world, as they tell people at my university. You know, cosmopolitanism trumps everything else. And so that the, the basic political need, I mean, the decent, not just decent, but pre preeminent, you know, uh, protect and, and help ennoble the lives of your citizens. But so that gets forgotten. Money, you know, trade is going to solve all problems. And now that's going to extreme. But that seems to be the, the drift of life in, in Venice. So it's only the old fogey law professor at Padua. Padua, you know, where Marsilio Padua, the uh, Averroist, also taught. I mean, there's that funny sort of connection going on there in that. Uh, but Padua is the, is the law school. Yeah. Um, so, I, I mean, I didn't mean to talk around your question, but um, uh, I've forgotten what your question well, is. More precise, I just was thinking, like, if you read me in brief, how could, how does the play re rebuff the objection of that forced conversion of Jews is, that's shocking to us, but like, the, the, right, how does it rebuff or, uh, of that? Well, it's in Thomas. Thomas is, 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 is crystal clear about it. I mean, in other words, um, uh, you can force uh, heathens, pagans, you can force heretics to come back to the, the fold, but not Jews. And you must raise Jewish children who are orphans. If they're raised in a Christian family, you must raise them as Jews. As, you know, as so the only exception to that would be if Jews deliberately uh, either propagandize or, or, or impede the Christian faith. That would be, and then, then you right. have to stop that. But so that's, that's clear Christian teaching. Um, and Antonio, of course, goes against, I mean, he, he doesn't know or something. But 
does the does Shakespeare show that on stage? Like I said, I sort of dismiss. Well, I think he that. shows it not in court, but by virtue of the critique of Antonio in Act Five. In other words, the fact that the play doesn't stand in Act Five, and the con connection is made through, uh, you know, you got the Duke says, you know, show some favor to this young doctor of Rome. Uh, I don't want, didn't do it for the money, you know, don't worry, I just wanted to see justice done and so on. Well, okay, I'll take your glove. Oh, what's that? That's a nice ring. Okay, I'll take your ring. Well, wait a minute. <laughs> That's the wedding ring. And he says, oh, look, I'll get you any other ring in Venice. Well, look, you, methinks you taught me how to beg, and now you're teaching me how a beggar should be answered. That's actually an extraordinary line, because that's exactly the teaching that, that um, Bassanio needs. That is to say, he's overly generous. He's generous with what isn't his to give, like other people's money, where he has to borrow the money. Why does he think he needs to borrow all that money to, go, to get a fancy ship, which then takes 90 days to get there, because he's got to go to the Adriatic and then find, <laughs> find the Piave River and go up the Piave. And then there's a lot in there about cross currents and, and rocks and things that can stop, you know, prevent a ship from. So it takes 90 days, which is the period of the, of the note, right? So it, it's an exact uh, match in time. Well, um, they've met each other before, OK? And he, t told, he told her two things. One, that he loved her. You know, second that he uh, all the wealth he had ran in his veins. That is, he was nobility, but not much money. Okay, now uh, and, and all she gave him back on that score was the eyes. I mean, that's enough for him. And maybe that was all she could do because Daddy is still alive, and she has to, at the minimum, get permission from Daddy, and Daddy would have to check. Him. But that never happened, and part it, partly never happened because. I mean, he was there in the company of the Marquis of Montferrat and some others. So that's either a military company, because Bassanio was a soldier, or maybe just to have some philosophical discussions. Uh, she's the modern version of Cato's Portia. Cato, the, the Roman Cato, taught his Portia philosophy. Uh, he also committed suicide, the ancient one, after reading through uh, ceremonially Plato's Phaedo, right? Uh, and he either did or did not go with the teaching of immortality there. I mean, he either did or did not understand Socrates. But, it, but he taught his daughter something about that, okay, which I think is integral to what she's doing. Uh, but anyway, um, so, uh, so he thinks that having told her that he's poor, what he has to do is to, and again, this is my speculation here. Why is he borrowing and, and wasting all this money? Well, he may be a bit prodigal. I mean, he's called that. But um, he's looking for investments to get money so he can show that he, he's not marrying her for her money. Or maybe show her dad. You see what I'm saying? So, but he's very bad at it. So he keeps borrowing from Antonio, and Antonio keeps lending, and maybe for these baser motives that we're talking about, you know, he, you know, he's tying Bassanio to his apron strings more. But, but, I'm not, but I'm not saying that he's being deliberately nasty. But of course, that is the effect. I mean, I agree with that comment. So this is why the initial pitch to Antonio for, look, this is the last loan, and this is what it's for, and this is going to solve all the money worries. But of course, for Antonio, this is the worst possible thing because he's going to lose Bassanio, whom he loves, I mean, it, independently of the money. Anyway, so he's got a, it be, because he, he thinks he's competing with all these other suitors, who of course are all losers. I mean, we find that out pretty quickly. Uh, and so that's wrong. I mean, he, he just misunderstood or she didn't say enough. So the one thing that's going in his favor is this whole casket thing. I mean, who among, if you, if you take a, Look at the profiles of these various suitors, the ones who don't choose and the ones who choose. Who would conceivably choose a leaden casket? None of these guys, right? They're too pompous or they're too whatever they are. Only somebody like Bassanio. So maybe after all she understood or, her, or daddy understood enough about Bassanio to know, okay, here's how to do it. And so the, the casket thing is not a way to sort of imprison Portia, but a way not only to protect her, I mean, that's pretty clear, but, I mean, she can rig these caskets however she wants. I mean, that, that, that line of that is clear. One of the uh, really loser suitors from scene two is, is a drunk, 
And so the suggestion, well, why don't we put a glass of uh, Rhenish wine on one of the wrong caskets so he'll choose the wrong, you know, they can do what they want with the caskets. So I, I think it's collusion between uh, the modern Cato, let's call him, and his Portia. And who, I mean, who knows, for all we know, the modern Cato committed suicide. He thought, you know, he, his life, he'd, he'd accomplished enough in life. Again, that's a little, you, you don't have to buy that, but on the model of the ancient one, that's what happened there. Anyway, it's an extraordinary play. This is my first Shakespeare play in, in uh, grade nine in high school. I found it really creepy. I just, it's been haunting me, so. <laughs> oh, is that on the tape? <laughs> yeah, yeah. In your opinion, does the play depict, or does a character in the play even depict the forced conversion as an act of change? I mean, I, I think, well, obviously Antonio thinks that. And uh, the Duke, see, it's hard to figure him because, I mean, he's already told Antonio at the beginning of that scene that, look, it's hopeless. Shylock will never change the movie. We've tried, you know, and it's just not working. So that his speech, he may or may not believe what he says about Jewish law, that it teaches mercy, but it's his only shot. And so, of course, the public teaching is that it does teach mercy, and, that, and since Portia picks up on it, and if I'm correct, that she's conscious of using a Jewish prayer, you know, we all do pray for mercy. I don't think she just means we all Christians. She means we all Jews and Christians pray for that. So assuming she means that, uh, so the, the only question is there, does the Jew, uh, you know, somehow agree with that? My sense is that he does. I mean, he's just trying to, uh, you know, be nice to everybody. I mean, he's, he's in charge of running this city and running the courtroom, and he doesn't know what he's doing in this crisis. You know, it, it's a real crisis. The Duke. The Duke. So he says the best he can. He's trying to be decent. Um, and, uh, but, yeah, I tend to think of him as a, as a pretty good guy, a pretty good Duke. Uh, I guess it's the same Duke as in Othello. I'm not sure. He's a pretty fair guy, you know. I mean... Uh, you know, if, in the circumstances. This sudden cosmopolitanism, you've got Othello, you've got Shylock, you know. The laws, it, 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 it may be that the laws are set up for it, but the Venetians have forgotten their laws, the, those laws. They're looking to the future. You know, you, the, Roman, the corruption of the Roman Empire is over. You don't have to worry about being a quiet little city in the backwater anymore. That's, that's how Venice is founded, according to Machiavelli. Uh, and it's a new world, a brave, <laughs> a brave new world. Is it a military powerhouse at that time, or is that not in the play? I'm just not familiar. Um, right. Well, it is in, 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 a, yeah, in Othello. Yeah, like in the Venetian armory, it's just popping out warships. <laughs> so. uh, a fellow seems to have enough ships for, at his disposal in that play, uh, and and the, the seas seem to be free enough for Antonio to be sending out six argosies. Right, okay. So that means either the British Navy or somebody. No, no, I'm kidding you. In the British Navy, the Venetian Navy must be around there somewhere. I, I would guess. So. I think uh, any questions we have can be continued in that conversation with the addition of a reception. Thank you very much. Thank you.